Hi, I'm Vivian Dutro. I'm an editor at Ignatius Press, and I'm delighted to be at this homeschooling conference with all of you. I have four grown children, and I homeschooled all of them through eighth grade, so I'm proof that you can live to tell the story later. <laughs> and Ignatius Press is a champion level sponsor of this conference. And all that means is I guess we've helped a little bit behind the scenes, but we are offering a 25% discount to uh, conference participants on our books. And, and we have lots of books uh, to help uh, pass on your faith and values to your children, whether you're homeschooling or not, quite frankly, they're, they're wonderful children's books. And Ignatius Press publishes uh, the book of our next speaker, Sherry Bloomquist. She wrote Before Austin Comes Aesop, uh, which I think she's going to tell you about. And uh, she also has written for us a biography of Maria von Trapp for young people, which we're going to be publishing very soon. And we're very excited about it. And in addition to being a fabulous author in her own right, um, Sherry is also a teacher. Uh, she's a mother of five children. Um, she's been involved in homeschooling for years, both as a parent and as a teacher. She has online writing courses. Uh, and uh, I think that's called the Denim Beret. And she has two websites that have resources for homeschoolers, uh, Once Upon a Pen, uh, What's In It, The Concerned Parent's Guide to Young Adult Literature, which, as we all know, is a very uh, great resource to have. And so with, uh, oh, and her educational background, which, uh, why did I not write that on my notes? But I happen to know that she's got an English major and a Bible major, and uh, she's a delight. So I, with no further ado, here is Sherry Bloomquist. Hello, and thank you for joining me. It is a privilege to be here today to share some thoughts with you on two of my favorite topics, children's literature and education. I hope it will help you in some small way as you continue your homeschool journey. In 1986, one of Disney's most delightful movies, Song of the South, was quietly and indefinitely archived by the company after its fifth theater run. This was because of the controversial way in which the relationship between a former slave and his master were presented in the storyline. Because of this decision, many of my peers will remember the movie fondly, but today's generation has grown up without ever enjoying the animated tales about Br'er Bear, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Rabbit the Academy Award-winning soul-lifting musical number, Zippity Duda, or the honorary Academy, Academy Award-winning performance of James Basket as Uncle Remus. And because of the movie's source, the classic Tales of Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris is usually overlooked in American literature. Both the movie and the book are in effect simply gone from our collective experience. In February of this year, another classic work was permanently shelved by its publisher due to its allegedly racist images, Dr. Seuss's And to Think That It Happened on Mulberry Street. Except that this time it did not disappear silently, and it was accompanied by five lesser known Seuss titles. This time I woke up in a way that I didn't with the disappearance of Song of the South. I quickly realized that a major work of children's literature, the legendary Seuss's first children's book, was actually going out of print and this mattered. It is not uncommon for a book to go out of print for financial reasons, but it is uncommon for the purpose of censorship. Hurrying to the computer, I quickly tried to secure a copy of my own through a used book website, only to discover that many other people had already bought up all the copies available. I was relieved that I wasn't alone, but I was troubled enough that I immediately bought the cat in the hat and green eggs and ham, just in case. As books and other arts increasingly face woke scrutiny and censorship in the secular realm, some and perhaps many Americans feel very protective of them, especially the classics that have impacted our world so profoundly. Regardless of their various vices and virtues, the forceful, I mean, sorry, the vices and flaws, 
The forceful removal of ideas and artistic works from the public square may have long-term negative consequences. They are artifacts of our civilization and it is better to discuss and debate and learn from them than to eliminate them. Therefore, I hope that my new book, Before Austin Comes Aesop, the Ch children's great books and how to experience them will play a small part in the preservation of important literary classics. I wrote it with two other purposes in mind though. First, I wanted to identify and celebrate the most influential literature in the lives of children throughout Western history. And second, I wanted to make children's literature more accessible to parents and educators so that young people can have a richer literary experience. These reasons arose from a concern that first began to trouble me in 2008. One day I was shown a book list for a literature class that some of my writing students were taking. On the list were eight or nine major adult classics that the students were expected to read and study during the eight months of the class. These students were only 14 or 15 years old. I wondered why the teacher felt that students this young were capable of absorbing them, for even I with my English education degree would find it challenging to study that many classic novels in only eight months in any meaningful way. And I wondered how could they be expected to have a meaningful experience reading these books when most of them didn't have the maturity to fully comprehend them, let alone analyze them. With the exception of Huckleberry Finn, which I thought was accessible enough, the book list seemed like an awful lot. But the teacher had taught the class before and I had only a little experience with teaching literature of any kind at that point. So I thought that maybe I was overreacting. As time passed and my oldest child approached high school as a homeschooler, I began to pay closer attention to other literature programs for early high school students. I noticed that many of them seemed to take the same approach of assigning several adult classic novels in a single year. And some programs introduced the more mature juvenile selections to elementary level students. Why, I thought, why these books and not the wonderful choices that were truly accessible at their maturity level so that they could not only comprehend them, but explore them at the depth they deserved. For teens, for example, why not books like Treasure Island or The Yearling? There were plenty of challenges in them and these students probably wouldn't go back to read them once they reached upper high school and college. Why couldn't the adult classics wait a bit? I mulled and fretted about it until I, a history, until I read a history of children's literature around 2013 that prompted a new question in my mind. Maybe I thought, maybe the main problem isn't that we rush students into mature classics too soon, but that we don't take children's literature seriously enough in the first place. Sure, we all know that classics like Winnie the Pooh, Little House of the Prairie, and Goodnight Moon should be staples on our child's bookshelf. We recognize that they are must read classics, but after all, they belong to the world of childhood. They are only for those people who due to their age and lack of maturity are unable to appreciate real literature yet. Novels and poetry by authors like Austin, Dickens, Shakespeare, Hemingway, and Poe. Once our children can read these and other classics like them, why shouldn't they? After all, college is only a few years away. We don't have much time to prepare them for the rigors of college English courses or to give them the solid literary foundation that we tend to equate with a good education. My belief, however, is that there doesn't need to be such a big rush away from the realm of childhood for excellent literature that is published specifically for children is real literature and is no less beautiful or valuable. In addition, there are a number of adult level options that are accessible to children and teens. There are so many in fact, that I would like to take a moment to define the term children's literature the way I use it in my book. Like most of you probably do, I have always considered it to mean literature that is published for a juvenile audience from board books to YA. And technically speaking, that is true. During my research though, I came to realize that a more realistic definition is that children's literature includes the books, tales and poetry that children have loved and claimed for their own throughout the centuries since long before children's literature even existed. This mostly includes literature published just for them, 
but some adult literature has either become known as children's literature, such as fairy tales, or it has been claimed by both adults and children for their own. The great American novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, is one important example. But even the best of literature that was written just for them, like The Secret Garden and Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, are rich and beautiful and profound all on their own. That they are simpler or that they feature children as main characters does not mean that they are less artful. They do not live in the shadow of Hawthorne and the Brontes, but are able to participate without self-deprecation in the great conversation of the ages. I love those words, the great conversation of the ages. They are so lofty, romantic, and grand. When I think of them, I imagine one of those literary salons of the past where the best thinkers, creative minds, and luminaries come together, perhaps in wingback chairs in an elegant, airy library. Some of them wear tweed coats and smoke cigars, while others glower beneath bushy brows and twitch their silver mustaches in disapproval. The ladies tap pencils against their lips in careful consideration of the speaker's words sometimes interjecting a piercing, thought-provoking response, and sometimes taking the floor with new ideas and counter-arguments. And I, as a reader, am allowed to sit in on this conversation, musing, considering, accepting, rejecting, discussing, and imagining. That's not all, though. There is also a little wicket gate in the door I enter through, painted in bright colors, just the right size for children. There is a room in the salon for them where they too can go to join the discussions. They are welcome to sit in with the adults if they choose, for some children do mature sooner than others. And some of the illustrious figures in the room can meet those who don't at their level, stretching their minds and sparking their imaginations like Tolkien and Twain. But there are other members with brilliant minds of their own who will meet them in a special salon set aside just for them, where the stories and ideas are child-sized, but no less beautiful and illuminating. A.A. A. Milne and Beverly Cleary and Laura Ingalls Wilder smile wide and welcome as they enter. It's a special place where children can, like the adults in the next room, also muse, consider, reject, accept, discuss, and imagine at a level just right for them. Adults are welcome to join these luminaries too, of course. The ideas and tales shared in here might be simpler, but there are riches to be had on several levels. Not everyone will enjoy the stories and ideas equally, but everyone has something to gain. And it is where, it is when minds are buzzing and imaginations are lit that the best part happens. New voices emerge in this great conversation. I'd like to talk about voice for a moment because of its importance in our children's development. In grammar, it has to do with active and passive sentence structure. In writing, the meaning is a bit more complex, but it has to do with the writer's personal presence on the page. Given enough time, I can teach most of the skills and habits that help students learn to write well. A distinctive personal voice, however, is one concept that I cannot teach only nurture and develop over many years. This is because voice is an inherent part of the writer, not a skill to be learned. And it isn't just the story or character, and it is vital to excellent writing. Often without realizing it, a big reason that we love certain books isn't just the story or characters in them, but the author's voice, his personal stamp on the page. Remove the voice and something essential is lost. But there is yet another kind of voice that is perhaps even more important. And it too is one we cannot teach, but only nurture in our children over time. This kind of voice has to do with what we have to say and whether we have anything to say at all. This kind of, to put it another way, it has to do with our own ability to contribute to the great conversation, to contemplate and examine the ideas of others. And then eventually when we are ready, perhaps to offer our own contributions. This is how the great conversation of Western civilization flows. <clears throat> New ideas and tales built upon a respectful consideration of the old. The conversation is open to everyone of all races and backgrounds and is one of the richest treasures we have in common. This doesn't mean that we should push our children toward the communication or creative arts 
especially if they are not gifted that way. But nurturing their voice through the, their education so that they can participate is a beautiful gift. Ideas reach our children from various sources, but immersing them in excellent literature has particular value in helping them learn how to think deeply and meaningfully, to discuss and analyze, to wrestle with complex themes and ideas, to examine and determine, to judge and evaluate, to imagine and visualize, to consider and weigh and decide and discern. Having the ability to think deeply like this will serve our children well throughout life, not just in school, and it will help them someday find their own voice in the great conversation. Perhaps it will be a quiet voice expressed in a private journal or with a few close friends. Or perhaps they will be called to contribute their ideas to a broader audience and add to the great conversation more publicly. But they need excellent fiction to develop this voice, both classic and contemporary, but especially children's classics that meets them where they are. As homeschool parents, we get to help them choose books to read. This is perhaps one of the biggest privileges of homeschooling, in fact, because our nation has been sliding away from the close examination of great classic fiction for many years. I first noticed it back in 1994 when I was taking my teacher training classes and the trend has picked up speed since the implementation of the Common Core Standards, which started to become widespread in 2010. Nonfiction has been replacing the traditional emphasis on quality fiction in English programs. And the fiction that remains is now often contemporary instead of classic. And it's sometimes even adult in its graphic, sexual and violent content. As a whole, American students are examining the classics of Western civilization, both as juvenile and adult, less and less every year. I've been watching this happen from the sidelines for a few years with some distant disappointment, but this past year, I watched it happen to my own son. Suddenly, the slide away from quality literature education became a bit too personal. One of my daughters is a rising senior in a public Tennessee high school, where this year she read some classic American fiction like The Crucible and The Great Gatsby. <clears throat> my son, however, left homeschooling to enter sixth grade at a creative arts school last fall, where he was given a summer reading assignment to be completed by the first day of school. It was a contemporary middle grade fantasy novel that I'd never heard of. I was disappointed in such a lackluster start to sixth grade literature but I decided not to fret about it. After all, it was just summer reading and it was supposed to be followed by some kind of discussion when school began. Maybe it was just a kind of mental warm up. As the semester wore on though, I became increasingly dismayed by both the low quality and the low amount of literature that he was assigned to read. <clears throat> a few short stories, articles, poems, and even blog posts, yet not a single novel. The reason the teacher gave, which made little sense to me, was COVID. I was thrilled when he told me his class was reading The Phantom Tollbooth, a major children's classic by the late Norton Juster, until he explained that it was just a play, a short adaptation designed to meet the Common Core standards, it turned out. I was crushed. In fact, aside from the Lewis Carroll classic poem, Jabberwocky, he wasn't exposed to any of what I considered to be excellent literature the whole semester either contemporary or classic. And the literary discussion points centered around the common core standards required for sixth grade. In other words, the standards dictated the discussion, not the literature. And the selections were chosen only because of how they served the standards, not because they were excellent. Worse, when I examined the literature program for the rest of middle school, I didn't see substantial improvement. Finally, at the semester break, we pulled him out of the school to resume homeschooling. The literature program wasn't the main reason for this decision, but it was definitely a factor. I wanted something better for my son, and I knew that I could get it in homeschooling. <clears throat> it is fair to wonder why fiction matters so much. What difference does it make if our children are reading more nonfiction in school, and if the fiction they read is only so-so? At least they are reading. Besides, nonfiction is extremely important for it encompasses many genres and is the category of literature that we read most throughout our lives. For me personally, a wide reading of nonfiction has shaped how I live and who I am today. 
In fact, other than the Holy Spirit's leading, the only reason I am Catholic today and not the former evangelical Protestant that I used to be is nonfiction literature because I didn't know a single Catholic person to help me on my journey. Nonfiction is also essential for academic studies of every kind. Without it, we cannot learn history, science, or many other subjects. Even the study of fiction and writing requires some reading of nonfiction. However, it cannot overshadow excellent fiction and poetry. Like nonfiction, it expresses truth just in a different way. It is through fiction and poetry that we can best examine the world and humanity and all its virtues and vices and its strengths and weaknesses and its beauty and ugliness. It is also a reflection of our past and an indication of our future. It allows us to think about ideas and meaning and who we are in ways that nonfiction cannot. It develops our vocabulary and sense of language. It helps us develop deep analytical skills and critical thinking so that we are not unduly influenced by others, but can think through ideas on our own. And it is essential for helping us to develop our own unique voices. <clears throat> for me, fiction has mattered profoundly throughout my life. It mattered when I was a little girl in third grade, enchanted by the little people who lived under a grandfather clock in The Borrowers by Mary Norton and by my favorite mouse friends, Marvin the Magnificent, Raymond the Rat, and Fats the Fuse in The Great Christmas Kidnapping Caper by Jean Van Leeuwen, I wrote my first big story, what I called a book, The Grandfather Clock Mouse. <clears throat> From that point on, my middle finger was always calloused and blue because I couldn't stop writing after that. Because I was exposed to a lot of poetry in school and was assigned to write poems too, I learned how to rhyme well enough to compose many of my own poems, like The Night Before on this slide, which I wrote around fifth grade when Shel Silverstein's poems were first popular. This and my obsession with the Broadway musical and novelization of Annie in sixth grade led me in high school to write a somewhat sad poem called The Runaway, which turned into my first published piece in a tiny little magazine that paid only one contributor copy. That gave me the courage to continue pursuing publication, both of short pieces and several book-length manuscripts, and helped me face frequent rejection for many years without letting it dampen my voice. <clears throat> then finally, after reading children's literature, a reader's history from Aesop to Harry Potter, a scholarly work by Professor Seth Lair, I found myself on a new adventure which eventually led to Before Austin Comes Aesop and the realization of my childhood dream to publish a book with a real honest to goodness publisher. Many different kinds of books helped me find my voice, but it was excellent children's literature that had set my mind on fire with ideas and language and stories and dreams. When we nurture our children's voices through excellent literature, we are not pushing them to become writers or teachers or speakers or even college students. We are introducing them to the great conversation so that they can someday participate in it. Whether it's through quiet examination and introspection, loud and intense discussions, or profound soul searching and connections with others. We are helping them develop their voice. But this isn't the end of the journey. The most exciting part is yet to come. And it is best explained through a line of poetry <clears throat> that I first encountered in one of my favorite movies, the 1989 award winner, Dead Poets Society. It is set in a 1950s boys boarding school named Welton Academy, which is classical in the way that some of us, myself included, like to romanticize. Coat and tie uniforms, brilliant teachers who embrace Western, civil Western tradition, a great books and Latin based curriculum, and even ivy-covered brick walls in an idyllic Vermont setting. Robin Williams, one of my favorite actors, plays the role of John Keating, a young English teacher who is himself an alumnus of Welton. Keating has just moved back to Welton from a teaching position in London. He loves teaching, literature, and language, and he deeply cares for his students. He begins the year by shocking his students when he encourages them to make their lives extraordinary, Carpe diem, he tells them, seize the day. 
Then within a, the strict bounds of a classical literature curriculum, he begins to inspire these boys to dream, to savor words and language, and to enjoy literature for its own sake, not simply as a means to a good report card. And then to develop and freely think through ideas rather than simply to conform to the status quo. One day during class, Mr. Keating says something that has echoed inside my mind for years. As he tries to help his students understand the importance of reading and writing poetry, he says, to quote from Whitman, oh me, a life of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish. What good amid these, oh me, oh life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists and identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse, end quote. Then Mr. Keating repeats Whitman's final line more slowly, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. Here he pauses and looks intently at each of the boys before asking them this question, what will your verse be? And we, the audience, watch as the light dawns on each boy's face as he begins to imagine his possible role someday on the grand stage of life. We too are part of this powerful play that goes on and on. And someday each one of our precious children will contribute, will contribute their verses. We don't yet know what those verses will be. God is not yet finished with them. And of course, he is the one we want writing our children's verses. The most important part of our parenting will always be passing on the faith. Scripture, doctrine, prayer, great hymns and liturgical traditions Without this, nothing else we do and nothing else our children do will mean much. But by immersing our children in the great conversation of the ages, by inviting them to that amazing literary salon that has a room just for them, where they can imagine and examine and begin to develop their voices, we will help prepare them to someday, when their minds and hearts are ready and with the Holy Spirit's leading, step onto the stage in the powerful play that goes on and on, and then contribute their verse. Thank you. Thank you for that fine presentation. I it you I I've been working with you now on on the books that you're writing, and so I had high expectations. But let me say, you exceeded my expectations. That was so well done, and and. Uh, I hope all the other parents appreciated it also and, and really aspirational too. You really, I think you have inspired a lot of people to, to consider the value of literature uh, in the development of the child. And so now I would like to turn to our audience and ask whether or not they have any questions. Um, I'm getting a lot of applause here on your speech. Powerful, excellent, wonderful, important. I'm so glad to attend. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for giving her that feedback, and it's richly deserved. Um, does, does anyone have a, a question, actually, for the speaker? I'm supposed to be uh, fielding this. Um, Here's one, when do we get to read her book? Her book is available now from Ignatius Press and you can use your 25% discount, I think, maybe to get it. Um, uh, yes, the book about Maria von Trapp uh, that's coming up. Uh, Sherry, would you like to say a few words about that? Oh, I'm really excited about it. I, um, I did not, I mean, I love Sound of Music like many of you have um, my whole life but I did not know the real story of the Von Trapps. And it is, I mean, there are parts of the movie that are that are right, but um, there's so much more and it's so fascinating, the real story of Maria's life and the, the whole Von Trapp family. So I really can't wait to share it. It's just fascinating and it's such a testimony to God's leading and God's faithfulness. So I definitely uh, can't wait. <laughs> it really is uh, uh, showing God's, leading and faithfulness and some very in a very dark chapter uh you know the nazi um takeover of austria and this family uh, dealing with that situation um 
very inspiring. And I just want to add that that this book is a kind of a novelized version, a fictionalized version of the true story. But Sherry, you, you did a lot of research, reading biographies and available material. You did a fabulous job, in my opinion, of, of um, recasting that a, a, as a narrative story. And uh, it's going to be part of Ignatius Press's vision series. We've got something like 33, 34 titles of biographies of saints and inspiring people. And the majority of these were published by a mainstream publisher back in the day, Ferrara and Strauss. Um, they went out of print, Ignatius picked them up. And uh, now we're starting to add new authors and new works to keep that series going. And uh, we're delighted that Sherry uh, is now one of our new authors, one of our new voices, right? Yep. In in uh, maybe she's got more up her sleeve after I, this. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, she's working on another one. Um, let's see. Here's some more questions. Um, when will it be released? Uh, that I think refers to your other book. Um, oh, uh, oh, can you share your PowerPoint slides? Um, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Maybe um, that maybe you can check with the present the uh, organizers, and you guys can work that out offline. Um, you mean well? Could they were they visible or does it they mean were visible? But the person oh, said okay. uh, couldn't take notes fast enough. Okay. Um, so, any case, yeah. I'll, I'll take that offline and work that out. Um, sure. Do you have a list of your top hundred children's books that every child should read? Well, guess what? That is what her book before Austin comes Aesop is actually. She's got a master list, masterfully done, set out chronologically with reading level, maturity level, thumbnails. Um, that's Even her, historical notes. And yeah. historical notes. So that's her list. You got to buy the book. Sorry. Um, went to Salzburg on my honeymoon to the convent. Uh, this person's asking, did something surprise you about the real story? Oh, wow. Um, gosh, well, I think the most surprising thing is that Maria actually went to jail at one point. <laughs> the whole Von Trapp family went to jail on Ellis Island, did not know they'd been in prison. <laughs> that was a new one. So I won't tell anymore was... because that will just whet your appetite. It's just, <laughs> let's just say Maria had a big mouth. <laughs> Yeah, that surprised me too. I had no idea they were incarcerated on Ellis Island. Kind of ironic, right? They come to the land of freedom. They've just passed the Statue of Liberty right. and, they're, and they're arrested. Um, Maria. Maria was a was a very bold woman and she just had, she was just a big personality, but it kind of got her into trouble. <laughs> uh, let's yeah. see. Um, oh, here's a question. Uh, do you address different literature needs of boys and girls in the book? Not really, Sherry, but maybe you can say something about that question. Um, I didn't want to make those distinctions because I, I feel like literature is literature and it belongs to both genders. It, it just, um, I don't want there to be a sense that boys can't re read Ramona or girls can't read, um, you know, Tom Sawyer. Uh, you know, there there's good books for both. And uh, so I didn't make that distinction, no. But parents can make that distinction and decide what's best for their children. That's that's my goal is to give parents the information they need to make the decisions that are right for their children. That's right. Very good. Uh, it's really up to the parents to to exercise the discernment that's really been specially given to them. And uh, Sherry's book is a great resource for doing that. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. The Maria von Trapp book will be coming out um, in the in next spring or maybe this fall. I'm it's not sure. It's only October before, but I didn't know if that was just tentative. Here, I'm the production manager. I should know, and she knows better than I do. Okay, it's supposed to come out in the fall. Excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, thoughts on censorship in children's literature. Um, I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that question. Maybe I'm just going to ask that person, uh, could you be more specific and I'll come back to you. Um, okay. Oh, here's a good, uh, just practical question. Any tips for finding books for kids who are an advanced reading level in terms of length complexity that they're ready for? 
but you still want to make sure the content is age appropriate. Well, in my book, um, each book in the list has a reading level that is uh, that is key to the. Um, oh, Vivian, I'm forgetting. It's not Lexile. It's the um, Ax Axios. Um, well, another reading measurement tool. Um, so it lists the grade level for reading ability, but then it, I also include an interest level because some books are easy enough to read, but are above a child, uh, you know, maybe above the maturity or interest level of that reading level, if that makes sense. Um, so I have both of those there to help parents discern whether this book might be too difficult or maybe it'll be easy enough, but too mature or too too uh, too easy. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful. The other thing that's helpful, if I may add, uh, uh, Sherry in, in her book, um, Before Austin Comes Aesop, She's got a parent's cautioned label right. that she puts beside certain titles. And I think that helps alert parents, okay, there might be mature material in here, and I need to look at this a little more closely. You want to yeah. say anything about that, Sherry? Um, yes. I mean, there's no way that I can, you know, discern every parent's uh, objection to every book. But there are a number of books that are commonly controversial or that have mature content that concern Christians, uh, such as swearing. Um, so and those books that are commonly known to have uh, mature content or anti-Christian content or things like that, then we put uh, the label parents cautioned. And one of them has parents extremely cautioned even um, because I didn't want to make the choice to take it out. I want you, the parent, to be able to make those choices. But I also want to alert you because sometimes we parents will say, oh, this is a classic. I'll give this to my child. You know, it'll be fine. But just because it's a classic doesn't mean it's going to align with um, our Catholic values uh, or your family's uh, values or whatever is appropriate for your child. So um, those labels will hopefully help. And that kind of circles back to uh, this previous question about censorship. The person has spelled out more specifically removing offensive passages, dumbing down vocabulary of classical books. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I'm against that <laughs> when it comes to classic literature. I think it should be left alone. However, the, you can sometimes find children's adaptations to classic literature uh, because you might want to um, expose the child to the story, but um, there might be some pretty heavy duty stuff in that. Like take the Bible, for example, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, dicey stuff in the Old Testament. And yet we've been sharing the Old Testament with children uh, for as long as uh, there's been, you know, the, the faith and uh, things like the Odyssey and the Iliad. Those weren't written for children. They were shared with children. They were part of their education in ancient times. But you know, there's a lot of heavy duty stuff in those too, but for younger children, you can find children's adaptations. Um, Tales of the Odyssey by Mary Pope Osborne is an excellent example of that. Where it's, and say the Odyssey with, uh, is child, child friendly. And Patrick, uh, Patrick Collum, he did all of the, uh, he did the Odyssey and Iliad together uh, in one volume. He also did, I think, um, Jason and the Argonauts or some of these things actually <laughs> do have, um, 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 adult content, quite frankly. And so, but really it's up to parents to, to decide. Sherry does in the book, uh, explain about children's adaptations and, and lists those in her reference section. Um, so but I think it's yeah. important to distinguish between censorship and adaptations, um, yes. adapt adapting for a younger readers isn't really censoring the material, it's um, it, censorship has more to do with trying to keep it from the public square, in my understanding anyway. Um, and so, you know, th there are two different things, you know, ad and ad adaptations are meant to be temporary, they're not supposed to replace the original. So, you know, it's great to expose your child to the tales of the Odyssey by Mary Pope Osborne, but that doesn't replace a reading of the Odyssey when they're you know, later when they're ready for that, uh, for a translation. It's not, you know, it's just to help them get to know the stories and because they're good stories. And I, all my children read those, that series and they all loved, they all enjoyed them. So, um, 
they're two different things, the censorship and adaptations. Excellent point. Yes. And uh, censorship is something a government does, uh, you know, uh, by preventing something from being printed at all. And, uh, and using discretion in, in, um, in, in, in guiding your children, you know, to things that are appropriate to them uh, is something different. However, what we are seeing with this cancel culture business is now we're seeing demands to literally remove completely from public access um, mm -hmm. books that were previously printed and now considered offensive. And that's definitely in the category of censorship in the sense that people who aren't married, maybe government organizations are kind of taking it upon themselves to okay. write the rules as to what should be made available. And uh, Sherry, I'm so glad you brought that up in your talk. I think it's important, especially now, because it's such a confusing time and it's a disturbing time. And, uh, you know, with the Dr. Seuss books being taken out of publication, you know, it's, it, it, it means something, it matters, and, and we need to be thinking about it um, and uh, asking ourselves what we're going to do about that, because it's not something we can just let go. It's no big deal. It is a big deal. <laughs> but in this case, the publisher chose to withdraw it, and Disney chose to withdraw Song of the South in, I mean, it's up to the publisher if they want to do that. It's, you know, private business. But at the same time, <laughs> it's concerning it's, to me. It, it is. Um, and I just, you got to wonder what's next. So I'm starting to buy up every classic I, I don't have, <laughs> you know, um, even if I don't like it. Because. You know, and I'd like to put a plug in here for Bethlehem Books, uh, a company that we partner with who for the last 20 years has been doing that very thing, bringing back into books, print, books that were canceled uh, since the 1960s, you know, they, some of them were canceled just because there were lots of children in the family and things like this. They were pulled from yeah, libraries, pulled, pulled from libraries, pulled from reading lists, pulled mm -hmm. from curriculum. And this little group started collecting, is buying them at book sales, buying them at library sales, and have been bringing them back into print. They have a wonderful website, Bethlehem Books, and you can find just a lot of great stuff that was deemed uh, no longer up to date. Great literature written by award winning authors, uh, published by mainstream publishers, but just whoosh, disappeared uh, because it wasn't considered. Of course, they didn't use the word woke back then, but that's essentially what was happening. And they're a great resource too, Bethlehem Books. I think it's um, important too to mention that just because I mention a book in the, my book doesn't mean it's that other books that I don't mention aren't worth reading. I mean, to put it another way, I didn't, I couldn't include every wonderful book that you might want your child to read or that you, that you loved yourself. I mean, there's books that I had to leave out that, you know, it's just, um, there's lots of wonderful books, even if they're not in my children's great books list. Um, so, you know, definitely don't be afraid to explore literature on your own. Just you know, mine is just a guide for, you know, for uh, some of the best of Western civilization for those who are especially interested in the classics. Well, that brings up another question. Why don't you um, let the audience know a little bit what your criteria were for putting together this, this list? Um, well, I tried, um, I, I do have a, a bulleted list in my book, um, but generally speaking, I tried to a focus on um, that they're Western, that they're they belong to Western civilization. Um, so you know, I'm not going to include uh, something from Russia in there, um, but uh, the Western civilization. And also, I tried to uh, focus on the books that were most influential, most important throughout literary history, um, not just in the development of children's literature, but there are a lot of children's books. That, a lot of uh, children's literature were also influential and important in adult literature in the development of adult literature. I'm sorry, I can't talk. Um, and and a lot of them they mirror, they kind of parallel the Western great books canon that has been around since I don't know what it was, the 1920s. There's kind of a, a great books canon, um, and and those books 
uh, reflect some of the most influential, most important thinking of Western civilization since ancient times. And so I tried to parallel that with books that have been important to children since ancient times, um, and not only important to children, but also important to the development of literature itself. Um, so I, so, I, that's not my bulleted list, but that's the gist of it. Right. So in short, what Sherry tried to do was come up with kind of an objective list, meaning these are the books that have um, been, have, have withstood the test of time, have been, have been, have won literary acclaim, um, have been loved by children for years and so on. Um, so that's not, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily a book, a list that accords with the Catholic faith or things like that. The, these not recommendations. It's, right. it's objective. It follows history and research, not what I wanted, what I thought was best. Right. And, and so that, that's pretty, that's pretty reliable. It wasn't really until, you know, the, the late 1960s when, um, we got into this kind of thorny, um, that's not modern enough. That's old fashioned. That's we we don't we don't want to talk about those things anymore. We want to talk about these things instead. Juvenile literature became a, a genre in its own right, uh, even though so it was being written adults for adults by adults. It ended up putting being put in kind of the young adult category and so on. And so that's where it really gets. Uh, that's where you really have to exercise a lot of a discernment. And I think Sherry, you give parents a lot of tools for helping to do that. I hope so. And, and also it's intentional that I stopped the list at 2000 um, because classics are something in development. You know, there's, there's being, cl there's classes being written now, <laughs> you know, it's just, they're not classics yet. <laughs> and um, it takes time. They have to withstand the test of time. So the last section of my book from 19, what is it, 60, Vivian, or something to 2000, isn't really the great books. It's the noteworthy books. It's the ones that are up and coming that, that, are, that are influencing society, that are impacting um, our children, um, and which have in, been influencing literature and the development of, of literature. But uh, I'm hesitant to call them the great books quite yet. So, and, and, and yet, you know, things that have an impact on the culture, I just loved Sherry, your mention of this great conversation and, you know, we're part of a society, we're part of a greater culture. And even though uh, it might be something that you object to as parents, a particular book or movie or something, if it's having a big splash out there, um, it, 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 it might deserve your attention. Even if yes. you decide it's not for your family, it, it's deserving of your attention because it, it becomes part of the conversation that we're all in. And so, and it um, it does, yes. will have influence. And so it's good to, to kind of be aware of, of what's on that list for those, uh, later years, even though they're not considered that it's too certain to call them classics, they have been influential and for good and for ill. And so, it's good to be part of the conversation about it, which Sherry, you certainly are. And so that's, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. We haven't had any more questions. And I know, Sherry, uh, thank you for your time and uh, all the effort you put into this fantastic presentation. And um, I'm going to sign off. Okay. Thank you so much for having me and for joining me, everyone. <laughs>